Thank you so much, KP, for that generous introduction and for once again being such a wise and stimulating host for the summit. Good day to all dear friends and distinguished guests of the Singapore summit all over the world. We are gathered together again this year, but online and in very unusual times. Are today's circumstances an apt metaphor for our subject this evening? After all, we are all far apart, but brought together in one shared conversation. Or is today's fragmentation a permanent condition? The precise motion we are debating is whether, quote, a leaderless and divided world is the new normal. This debate opens up questions about today's global system that we will surely investigate in some depth this evening, such as, does the world need a single leader? Or can multiple superpowers peacefully coexist? Are we fixed upon the present course of division? Or is a new kind of global governance on the horizon? If I were debating the motion this evening, I would have great difficulty deciding what side to take. Very often, we read too much into the present, extrapolating from narrow and negative experiences. After all, for all the trauma that the pandemic has caused, the world has also shown how rapid multilateral cooperation is possible. On the other hand, there are structural shifts in the global balance of power that have been underway for some time. And it isn't likely that a single election or trade deal will lead to reconciliation. I would also not want to have to choose sides between four friends who are our esteemed debaters. Allow me to introduce them to you. Supporting the motion this evening, we have Ian Bremer, the founder and president of Eurasia Group. Professor Jan Schwatong, the dean of the Institute of International Relations at Tsinghua University. And opposing the motion, we have Professor Nairi Woods, dean of the Blavatnik School of Government and professor of global economic governance at the University of Oxford. And Professor Neil Ferguson, the Milbank Family Senior Fellow of the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. So, the structure of the debate is as follows. After our opening poll, each speaker will have five minutes for opening statements, and we will alternate between the two teams. This will be followed by about 20 to 25 minutes of freewheeling debate between all the panelists, as well as taking live Q&A from yourselves. We will then have short two-minute closing statements from each speaker. And finally, a poll to close out the debate and determine the winner. Let's begin with the opening poll. I now invite you all to cast your votes on the motion, a leaderless and divided world is the new normal. You have just 10 seconds, so please do hurry. And as you vote, do remember to actively submit questions for the Q&A as you listen to the opening statements in round one. Very excited to see the results. And now, without further ado, let's kick off the debate. The first speaker speaking for the motion will be Ian Bremer. Ian, you have five minutes. Thank you so much, Parag, and greetings to uh, my, my friends, uh, whether antagonists or not, on the panel. Um, I, look, I wrote about the coming G0 world some 10 years ago, uh, not a G7, not a G20, but a world where we did not have uh, international leadership, where we were much more divided. Uh, and so clearly, I'm arguing for the proposition. The other side would be pretty difficult for me, given that history. Um, and I want to be clear, it's not about Trump. It's not about Xi Jinping. These trends were coming, and I wrote about them well before either of those men uh, were in the positions that they presently are. I also want to be clear that this isn't forever. A geopolitical recession, an unwind of the existing political institutions and architecture is something that happens cyclically. cyclically. Um, and we will have a new global order at some point that does bring countries together, but not for the foreseeable future. And in fact, coming out of the pandemic, it's going to be more divided, not less. And that's why leaderless and divided is the new normal. There are a few quick reasons for that. The first, my own country. We don't want to lead globally. Um, my country is getting much more divided. People are much angrier about the idea that the U.S. should be the global sheriff. Uh, 
or the architect of free trade or the promoter of global values. That was the reason why Trump got elected. It's also the reason that the Democratic Party has been driven much more to the left. Uh, the transatlantic relationship is becoming more divided and countries inside Europe are becoming more divided. That's why we got Brexit. Um, that's why we've had uh, the Gilets jaunes movement in France. That's why we've had the League um, in Italy. Uh, these are structural forces too. Russia is in serious decline, um, but they're angry about it. And they blame the West, particularly the US. So to the extent the Russians are making a difference, they're largely trying to delegitimize the existing institutions from the West and further that dissent. Three, China's getting bigger, they're becoming more powerful, but unlike the Western establishment view over the past few decades, they're not reforming towards the West as that occurs. They're still state capitalist, they're still authoritarian, and under Xi Jinping, they're actually consolidating power to the extent that they're building international architecture, it's largely um, competitive with that of the United States. And fourth, technology is no longer bringing us as easily together. Um, 10 years ago, there was a lot of support for democracy that came from technology. And you saw that with the Arab Spring, you saw it with the colored revolutions in the former Soviet Union. Today, technology is much more about surveillance and big data. It's driving us apart. It's why we see a technology cold war between the US and China, the two tech superpowers. And that's just getting started. I think we passed the tipping point there, which means not only leaderless, but very deeply divided. Final point, the United States is the only true superpower out there for the near term future, not just economic and technological, but also military and its energy and its food resources and the rest. So if there was going to be true leadership, it would need to come from where I'm presently sitting. And that's the biggest problem of all, because this state of affairs, the G zero world doesn't hurt the United States the way it hurts other countries. Indeed, that's going to be even more true coming out of the pandemic than it was before. The importance of American tech companies vastly stronger coming out of the pandemic than they were before, while the Europeans, the Japanese, the Singaporeans, they don't have them, right? The role and the strength of the dollar, the role of the American banks compared to the European banks, the energy, the food export, and the geographic location, harder for terrorists to come from all over the world or forced migration, no arms races directly on American shores. So for all of those reasons, even as the G0 persists in a way that none of us really like, the Americans are not going to be hugely interested or feel the impulse to fill that vacuum in the near term. So I believe that we're going to be leaderless and divided going forward for the foreseeable future. Thank you very much. Ian, thank you so much, giving the uh, opposition a lot to respond to. And uh, for the op opposing the motion, we'll begin with uh, Neil Ferguson. You have five minutes, Neil. Thanks, Parag. Well, six years before Ian published uh, his uh, G0 book, I wrote an article entitled A World Without Power for Foreign Policy Magazine. And it's partly on the basis of that article that I'm going to argue that a leaderless and divided world will not be the new normal. Um, a divided world is the old normal. When was the world ever really united? A, a leaderless world, G0 uh, in Ian's phrase, implies a world without any dominant powers, a world that lacks order and is in fact anarchic. But when has that ever been the case? Leadership is rarely, if ever, provided by one power. More usually, there are two to five great powers that compete, sometimes cooperating and sometimes colliding. You can see that if you go all the way back to 1648 and the Peace of Westphalia, uh, from then until 1789, it was essentially a story of the expansion of Europe at the expense of non-European powers from 1789 to 1815, it was France versus the other great powers. From 1815 to 1914, uh, 1914 it was uh, Rankers, Pentarchy of five great powers. Uh, then you had the age of the world wars, 
battles led by great empires, coalitions forming with lesser powers. Cold War I from 1949 to 89 was essentially a two superpower order. Uh, there was a brief decade, I'm going to call it the American decade after 1991, uh, when really the United States was the only show in town. But even then you could see the beginnings of what I called Chimerica and Ian called G2 less originally. Uh, and uh, from that <laughs> point, I think until 2016, you're really talking about the origins of Cold War II, which is where we find ourselves now. Now, I agree with Ian in just one respect. COVID-19 has been a moment of revelation, uh, but the conventional analysis, which you just heard from him, is that it's exposed uh, American weakness uh, and uh, it's exacerbated division. But I think that's quite wrong. I can think of four, maybe even five areas where American leadership has been very striking this year. Uh, firstly, financial leadership. Uh, the world turned to the Fed uh, for leadership uh, at the depths of the crisis in financial terms back in March. Uh, vaccine leadership. I don't think there are many people out there who think it's going to be a Chinese uh, or for that matter, Russian company that gets the first reliable uh, vaccine. It's much more likely to be Moderna or maybe Pfizer's backed BioNTech. Uh, there's technological leadership where we've seen increasing success for the American campaign to limit the power of Huawei. Uh, AI leadership, 18 out of the top 25 institutions for AI research are in the United States. And we've just seen remarkable breakthroughs in the Middle East, which must be at least to some extent attributed to US leadership. I don't think without US leadership that we would have got to the deals between the Gulf states uh, and Israel that we've just seen. True, China is attempting to lead in a number of different domains. One Belt, One Road, the New Silk Road, the Health Silk Road, the export of surveillance technology. But if you look at uh, what's happened in Chinese diplomacy this year, it's actually been an epic fail. Wolf warrior diplomacy has largely backfired on China, especially uh, in Europe. Now, I think if you look at the institutions that are available for global leadership, despite uh, rumors of their demise under President Trump, they all look remarkably intact. The UN Security Council's permanent members, the International Monetary Fund, NATO, they're all functioning as normal, in fact. Uh, and so I don't see the kind of crisis of liberal order that we very often hear about. Let me make one final point. Donald Trump is not the first president of the United States who has sought not to lead. On September the 10th, 2013, Barack Obama announced that the United States was no longer, quote, the world's policeman. But the world has an inherent need for leadership. If the US genuinely can no longer provide it, someone else will, perhaps China, Perhaps, who knows, a European Union that now seems to have its own relatively strong leadership in Berlin and Paris. So the idea of a new normal in which the world is uh, leaderless and divided makes no sense to me. The world's always divided to some extent. Does any of us actually want a one world, one government? But as for leadership, that's always there. I can't think of a single era in history when the world has been truly leaderless. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Neil. A world of multiple competing leaders. Let's go back to the team uh, for the motion. Professor Yan Shuatong, you have five minutes. Well, thank you, Chairman. And uh, since we're talking about the uh, leadership, my understanding, actually, people talking about the global leadership. Actually, we never heard the term global leadership during the Cold War. The reason is that during the Cold War, in the bipolar world, and the U.S. and the Soviet Union and the, uh, shared the power, they do not uh, provide a joint leadership. So only after the collapse of the Soviet Union and the United States become the only superpower dominating the world, and then U.S. provide the uni, uh, lead, global leadership. So now this is from ascending and the world is moving into a new bipolar world, no longer dominated by the United States. So that means the uh, U.S. can no longer offer uh, a, a unipolar a, a uni, uh, leadership. Is that possible for U.S. to take a, uh, uh, have a joint efforts with the other powers, China, to provide joint leadership? 
for my understanding, that's impossible. I think the U.S. and the Soviet Union didn't provide a joint leadership for the world. Mm. This time, it's the same. China and the U.S. are competitors to each other to provide joint leadership. They cannot follow the suit, the, like the leadership of Germany and France for EU. And at this moment, from my understanding, there's more competition between the giants rather than the cooperation between them. Well, since like that, in the next 10 years, I would say, and the U.S. is still the strongest superpower. And the U.S. still uh, have a, a part, uh, uh, there's a dis power disparity in terms of the U.S. That means if U.S. is beyond the U.S. capability to provide a global leadership, it certainly is beyond the China, China's capability to provide global leadership. So from my understanding, very possibly, with this, uh, the current situation will last for a decade. That means uh, there's uh, no global leadership in the next uh, decade. So the last uh, point, the world will be divided. So the question is not whether the world is divided, it's how divided. It's uh, divided in what way? My understanding, we are going to have a bipolar world, but the world won't be divided by two camps, by two blocks. And because China resists on non-alliance of principle, and the U.S. seems to me, at least the Trump's administration, does not have that kind of interest to organize the traditional allies and uh, as a camp and uh, uh, to maintain uh, uh, a kind of uh, a polar uh, uh, collectively. So in that way, the world are very possibly divided in many, many groups according to specific issues. Okay. Thank you so much, Professor Yuan. Uh, any further points, or is that complete? Oh, if you if you give me time, I want to say about the norms. Actually, what, that's absolutely true, you, and the norms minute. could be different types. Oh, very short. I mean that uh, now, during the co uh, after the Cold War, we have a, a norm based on liberalism that uh, actually headed by the United States. But uh, now, from my understanding, we are going to have new norms. But the new norms is not based on one dominating ideology, but based on the com uh, confrontation. Very possibly, different groups develop their own norms to govern the behaviors uh, among themselves. But uh, there's a the new global norms may not be occur in a ver uh, very soon. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Professor Yan. The new bipolarity is the state of play. Uh, before we move to our final speaker, just to remind uh, all of our panelists, you will have a chance as we move into the next block of the debate to ask each other questions. So please give some thought to that. Now, uh, for our final speaker uh, against the motion, Professor Nairi Woods, you have five minutes. Yes, and hello, everybody. Um, so why do people want to argue that the world is leadership is leaderless and divided? So for some, it's because they're disappointed that the clear leadership they see is not the leadership they would like. For others, it's because they simply want to resign themselves to this idea that the world is divided, even though they know in their hearts that there are forces which people feel are unfair. And it's true that humans compete, but that doesn't mean that we can say the world is inexorably divided. I think there's a third argument that perhaps uh, Ian has put on the table which is a view that, that American leadership of the world is so normal that if we lose American leadership, the world becomes leaderless. And I think Neil has, has rightly dispelled that view because historically, the idea that one country leads the world is the exception. If we go back to the examples Neil gave us, think about the concert of Europe, the 19th century, the idea that five great powers come together to create some minimal rules alongside which they vigorously compete with one another. And it was always normal within those rules. Look at Britain at that time, trying to, on its own, claim that the world should go to global free trade, much as it's trying to do today. And the rest of the world laughed and forced Britain to do bilateral negotiations then, and it will do the same now. So what is leadership? What does it mean to say a world that's led and that's led in a way that helps resolve what might be divisions. It means don't take the easy route 
as an audience. Don't just say, well, it's leaderless and divided. There's nothing we can do. Think, look much more carefully at a world where countries and communities always compete and where what we're looking for is, is there a minimum base of rules and are those rules being used enough and changing fast enough to ensure that we get competition but within this modicum of rules. Let me pick up on the places where this is very obviously happening with the overall argument that what, what signals the transition we're looking at is that China is not trying to replace a US-led system of governance. China has entered into that system of governance, those international institutions that the United States created and has competed within them for influence to become a great funder. And therefore, we're getting an increasingly complex leadership, but it is a leadership. Think about when the United States withdrew from the World Health, announced it would withdraw from the World Health Organization. China stepped forward and committed $2 billion to it. Think about the way China has risen in the IMF and the World Bank. These are US created institutions that sit in Washington, DC, in which China is now the second largest shareholder and the second largest, therefore, contributor. That's important because it shows a willingness by China to sit in Washington, DC on the United States own turf and to help fashion and push for change in those rules. Is it uncomfortable for America? Of course it's uncomfortable for America. Any change is when you're at the top of the system. Is it actually producing change? Yes, it is. We're seeing every international institution change and get pushed to listen to more of its members. In other words, for the third countries in the world, for the smaller countries, the new competition between the China and the United States across these institutions does not spell doom and gloom. It spells an opportunity for other countries to start playing off those superpowers and push further for the changes they've been wanting in those institutions themselves. Think about the other leaders in the world that have brought about great change. Think about during the COVID crisis. We've seen so much leadership in the world. We've seen, as Neil said, a Federal Reserve step out, even as China and the United States were yelling at one another to provide uh, special financial lines of credit and repos to some 14 other countries. We've seen the European Central Bank bring Europe together, announce 750 billion euros worth of bonds and start making sure that all of Europe moves together outside of the crisis. We've seen the G20, even for those of you that pay so much attention to China and the United States antagonisms, those two countries sitting at the same table and agreeing, yes, it was only a small agreement, but it was an agreement to suspend the debt repayments of the poorest countries in the world. We're seeing leaders in private organizations think about the Gates Foundation and the Wellcome Foundation led by Jeremy Farrar coming together to announce a world campaign to cooperate on treatments for COVID-19 and access to those treatments. In other words, you can choose to say we live in a leaderless and divided world, but that's just to give up and go back to bed and you know, have a cup of tea later on. If you actually want to be part of a world where countries robustly compete and in which there are some rules which contain that cooperation, start looking for the kinds of leadership that Neil and I are talking about and, and work on ever improving those and strengthening those. Thanks. Thank you, Nairi. So competition over rules, but within the system. You've all made very compelling opening statements. Thank you so much for those. We now have about 20 minutes or so for a conversation amongst ourselves. We'll also be taking questions from the live audience around the world. Please do continue to send your questions. I'm going to ask each of you a question and ask you to respond to it and also Feel free to then pose a question to any member of the opposing camp. Let me begin in the same order that we have, uh, have uh, run so far. Uh, Ian, you've said it's G0 now more than ever. Neither China nor Russia want to see, uh, you know, American or U.S.-centric world. The U.S. itself is not really on board, so it's more of a new Cold War than ever is what you said. My question for you is the following. You also feel that the U.S. is getting weaker structurally. Could it be that it is out of a position of weakness that the U.S. could turn towards multilateralism or new forms of international cooperation by necessity because it cannot afford, nor is it legitimately accepted 
as the world's policeman. It's funny that you bring that up, um, Parag, because um, Neil, you got that from Neil. He said that I said that the United States was getting structurally weaker. That's not what I said. I actually said that it's precisely because this new global order does not hurt the United States particularly, the U.S. doesn't feel compelled to actually intervene uh, particularly. So you look at the strength of the United States. You look at the role of the dollar as global reserve currency. You look at the impact of U.S. tech companies, vastly more important in the pandemic and after the pandemic than they were before. You look at the relevance of the U.S. banks, which are much stronger than European banks and Asian banks, and will be much more important given the immense volatility we're going to see in the global economy over the coming years. If the United States felt like, oh my God, without leadership, this is going to hurt us. It's not going to hurt Afghanistan. It's not just going to hurt Syria. It's not just going to hurt these other places that we can barely find on a map, but it's going to hurt us. That's why the Americans got involved in World War II. It was Pearl Harbor. Before then, there was much more of a not our problem kind of impulse. So I, I think that precisely makes my point. Um, and the question I think I want to ask, uh, one other thing I would say is that I, I, I don't want to come across as an American nationalist that if it weren't for the United States, you can't have leadership. But we need to understand that for global leadership, the United States puts, spends more on defense and military than the next seven countries in the world combined. Still, we still have the world's reserve currency. We still have the largest economy. We still have the most important tech firms in addition to China. Um, if you take that out, if the Americans decide they don't want to play, um, then you're not going to have functional global leadership. And that's very clear in the pandemic, which I think we'll talk about. And it's very clear on things like climate, other big global challenges too. The question that I would want to ask is, do, do, does the opposing team believe, given uh, the proposition, that it's enough to argue uh, simply that the world has leaders? Or don't you also have to argue that the world is not going to be divided? I mean, I, I thought you'd have to say that it both the new normal is to have leaders and to be more unified. And, and I, I strongly push back against both of those. It wasn't clear to me from the opening statements that both of the other speakers do. Uh, feel free, uh, Neil or Nairi, would you like to respond to that? Happy to. Uh, it's, it's great to hear Ian agreeing uh, with uh, our view that U.S. Uh, dominance is still in many domains intact. Uh, it seems to me to completely undercut his G0 story. Uh, actually, as I tried to point out, the most striking feature of 2020 has been the fact that despite repeated predictions of the demise of American leadership uh, under Donald Trump, uh, the U.S. still leads, uh, and Ian's added a few more points uh, to that argument. The U.S. tech companies are still dominant pretty much everywhere outside uh, China. The U.S. reserve currency uh, is not only the reserve currency, but the principal currency in which uh, international trade is conducted. Uh, so I, I think it feels almost as if, as if Ian has changed sides in this debate. Uh, I think part of the problem with the motion before us is that uh, it, it implies that the world could ever be anything but divided. And as I said, uh, that, that's uh, absurd. There's never really been a time of one world government and there never will be. Even in the 1990s in the unipolar moment, it wasn't as if the US was in sole command of international institutions, uh, far from it. But I, I'd like to ask a, a, another question, uh, which is really how useful uh, the term new normal really is. Uh, uh, I think Ian and I would both be delighted if we could coin a phrase that's become as common uh, in everyday parlance as new normal. It was our mutual friend Mohammed el who I think came up with it. But when you pause and reflect for a moment, it's a kind of weird term, uh, because uh, how, how can something be both new and normal? Uh, and, and when, in fact, has there been a normal time? I think the point that Nairi Woods and I are trying to make is that if you think there was this normal time where there was undivided uh, leadership, preferably American, you're engaged in some kind of fairy tale fantasy because the world has never been like that. So I, I'd just like to ask, uh, uh, our opponents uh, if they can in fact define what the new normal means. 
Could I, could I jump in just on the other Please point do, that, Ian, that Ian was making, which is whether or not the United States needs multilaterals? Because I, I took it that Ian's argument was that the United States is so big and powerful it doesn't need multilaterals. And this is a repeating theme in US politics. Six months before Ronald Reagan became president in the 1980s, he made a speech saying that the United Nations was a complete waste of time. The United States would do everything to get out of it and to, to destroy it. Actually, within a few months of taking office as president, he made a speech to the United Nations at the opening of the General Assembly, talking about how important the United Nations was. Similarly, President Bush on the IMF, when the United States ran into problems with Argentina, immediately saying the IMF is useless, you know, it must do what we tell it to, and then realizing very quickly that that's terribly costly for the United States, and that's why it needs multilaterals. It needs to do things by agreement, coercion, very seldom works. Look at the pres President Trump's administration. The administration thought when it came to picking the leader of the Food and Agricultural Organization, an organization created by the United States, that it could afford simply to lay down what the United States wanted and everybody else would jump into line. And they failed. And instead, the leader became a Chinese vice minister. But the United States didn't walk away sulking from that experience. It learned from it and said, it really matters to us that these multilaterals work and that the United States is represented in them. Appointed a special envoy and made sure when it came to the leadership of the World Intellectual Property Organization that it was a Singaporean candidate who they were, who they were much more supportive of that won that leadership election. So the United States does go through pretty much with every president, a period of being antagonistic towards the international organizations because it imagines, perhaps as Ian might have alluded, that it doesn't need them. And it always learns the lesson that it does because the alternative to sitting down and talking in an international organization is to go alone with force, with coercion, and that is always more costly and less successful in international affairs. Perhaps this is a question then for Professor Yan, because if, as Nairi is saying, uh, you know, countries, in the case of China, for example, even though you are defending the motion that the world will be leaderless and divided, China today is making its utmost efforts diplomatically to gain influence through multilateral institutions. So could you comment on that as part of China's strategy to actually fill the leadership void? Well, uh, I think that this is a very good question. And uh, I want to make a distinction between the leadership and the strongest power. And a country have the uh, largest power in the world. It doesn't mean it is the lead, uh, uh, providing a leadership or being a leader of the world. And uh, leadership is based on follower. And without a follower, there's no leadership. These things go together. And so if you look at uh, what uh, Americans' uh, 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 leadership in the early period of uh, uh, end of the uh, 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 post-Cold War, and when the uh, uh, senior Bush launched the uh, Gulf War, he got 37 countries joined this uh, military uh, uh, campaign, the, joined the war. But when junior Bush and, uh, launched the war in the Iraq, and the only... 13 countries. And now I doubt if the Trump administration launched any war, he can get a country more than, uh, more than 10, possibly cannot have uh, more than five. So America's leader, leadership is uh, when there's no follower, you cannot be a leadership. So come to the, still talking about the US, when the Trump administration withdraw from the international organizations actually established by the United States, that means they gave up the instruments or the institutions to exercise the leadership. And I'd like to come to the question related to China. China resists uh, uh, to uh, work in these organizations and the support of all of these organizations, but it doesn't mean that China already playing a leading role in these organizations. And for instance, China have to negotiate with Germany, with France, with all of the, the other, uh, Russia, with the major powers for talking about uh, what they can do collectively rather than China give a, a, a call and uh, the other to follow. And by now, I didn't see the, any major powers follow China's uh, uh, call. 
So without a follower, you cannot call that the leadership. That's why I, I still uh, uh, think there's no global leadership today. The second question related to this is that American have a military budget. It's as large as the that of a after uh, seven countries operate. Such, such a huge military budget. And the, what's the purpose for having this budget? And usually, U.S. have the huge military budget for maintaining world order. That means uh, not only protect Americans' own security, but for maintaining the world order beyond Americans' territory. Today, Trump administration tried to withdraw troops back to home, and they do not care about the order uh, out beyond the United States. So that's why even the U.S. still keep the large military budget, but then they no longer use that uh, money to maintain the world order. So at this moment, that's why Chinese uh, foreign ministry is like that. And uh, currently, the most disturbing factor to global order is not uh, any other countries but the United States. So generally speaking, U.S. have the resources, can maintain the world order, and also have the resources to disturb the order. That depends how do they use the resources for what purpose. Thank you. Uh, Neil and Naira, you've both referred to previous eras of history where there was some degree of cooperation or entente among great powers in the system. However, those were all Eurocentric orders. Can you foresee in this world in which there are uh, great powers and superpowers emerging from Asia, such as China, and legacy powers such as Japan, that there can be a similar kind of multipolar coordination, if you will, such as the likes of which we've never seen before. It's much more difficult, in other words, to imagine a concert of powers on a global scale than the regional scale among European powers, such as we've had in the past. And it seems to me that would be one fair test of whether or not we can overcome the leaderlessness and division of the world. I think it's uh, quite easy to find periods uh, when there was leadership that was regionally subdivided, uh, though I think to speak of global leadership in the ninth and 10th centuries would be a stretch. I mean, if you, if you go back uh, to that time, a time when Europe was very far from dominant, uh, the leadership of the West was divided between uh, the, the Pope who led Christendom, the heirs of Charlemagne who divided up what was left of the Roman Empire, uh, and on the other side, you had uh, Byzantium. At the same time, the Apposid Caliphate was reaching its, uh, its, its zenith, uh, although by the 10th century, it was beginning to fade. And if you look in the Chinese case, the Tang and Song dynasties were certainly uh, uh, offering regional leadership uh, in, in East Asia. Uh, so I think it's, it's possible to find periods of time in which the world was less uh, Eurocentric or, or less West-centric. And in all those periods, what you see uh, are empires that emerge with, with regional power. I've often argued that the way to understand history is as the history of empires, not the history of nation states, which are relatively uh, recent in, in their origin. Uh, and if you look back at, at the world in those terms, you'll see that it is perfectly normal for there to be regional empires, uh, which of course touch, I mean, there were points of contact between the empires uh, back in uh, the ninth and 10th uh, centuries. You might even say that the era ended uh, with the, uh, the First Crusade. But my sense is that, that that's a perfectly imaginable world, and, and indeed I think a world that we're heading towards, where uh, the US is primus inter pares, uh, but China is clearly the leading power in, uh, in East Asia, just as Germany is the leading power, power in Europe. Uh, that, that's a divided world, I suppose, but I mean, as Nairi and I have argued, the world's always divided. It's just that in such a world, there's leadership uh, at a regional level. Where the other side is clearly wrong is in imagining a world without any leadership, which is a, an anarchic world. And oddly enough, it's really hard to find a period of true anarchy uh, at any point in recorded history, because recorded history, as I said, Parag, is, is the history of empires. So this is the new Middle Ages scenario of uh, no global leadership, but certainly the presence of regional leaders across the world. Uh, Ian put his fingers up. Let's give Ian a chance, Ian a chance to respond to that. And then we have a question from the uh, live audience. Ian, please. 
Uh, okay, let me instead turn to, uh, while we're getting Ian back, let's turn to a question from the uh, audience. Now, I think the legitimacy of a global order rests to some degree on its acceptance by the other powers in the system. And we haven't spoken quite enough about that. So the question that we have is, is if the world is to be divided into two camps, does it mean that countries will be forced to choose sides? So uh, would anyone like to take that question around the rest of the world? How do they see this? And will they accept uh, a world that is bipolar? Uh, Professor Young? No, Irie, would you like to okay. take it? Well, uh, actually, I think uh, in any kind of bipolar uh, world, uh, except the two polars, uh, all of the other countries uh, have to uh, facing the pressure to, uh, to choosing sides. I don't think that they have uh, uh, other choice. But, and uh, they still have a lot of choices. First, uh, they can take sides for either uh, uh, one of them, or they can take a size simultaneously for, uh, uh, from both sides. Currently, we have a term called uh, hedging. The hedging strategy means uh, taking sides with the US on issue A and taking sides with, uh, uh, with China on issue B. For instance, for, uh, uh, this is especially uh, 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 invented by the Singapore and so-called the uh, uh, stay with China on the economy and rely on the U.S. for security. And the later on, this strategy from Amsterdam become a prevail all over the world. And even Japan adopted the same strategy, economically cooperated with China, but secure in terms of security, closely uh, sided with the United States. And now you find the Germany and uh, uh, France and um, even the major powers and uh, start to do uh, this. So this time, even we come to a bipolar world, it's not a cold war. First, this uh, bipolar competition is not driven by ideology, but by technology, mainly digital technology. Second, and this is a bipolar by two superpowers, but not by two military uh, uh, groups. And the second, and this competition mainly through technological invention rather than proxy war. And uh, I think the last uh, maybe is uh, also very important is that this competition for secular interests not for this ideological uh, 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 ideas. And that means by this moment, and China, the world center is shifting from the Europe to East Asia, but I don't think the East Asian will provide a dominating ideology for the world. And so nowadays you find that if we want to have a world order, the order is based on a global norms. The norms rest on a kind of a dominating ideology, just what we experienced after the Cold War and the liberalism. But now there's no dominating ideology, and China cannot provide a, a global ideology. Without a global ideology, there's no global norms. There's no such a kind of a order and based on that a norm. So my argument is that the world center did, is shifting from the Europe to Asia. But it doesn't mean that we are going to have a non-Western and a, a, a world order. Uh, let's right, uh, let Nairi jump in on this. And Nairi, okay. please also add, can you envision other countries that we have not yet spoken sufficiently about? Actually, both you and Niall have alluded briefly to the European Union. There's been no mention of India or other countries. Can you imagine as we look forward in this scenario, with other countries being active suppliers of order and leadership in various domains. Yeah, so um, if you imagine that to create a completely separated two poles of the world, you know, each side would either have to be so incredibly attractive in their offer that all countries wanted to go one side or the other, or so, you know, one side so repugnant that they all went the other way. And that is clearly not the case. So countries are going to have to choose on some issues and some of those choices might well be uncomfortable. But for the most part, there is simply not enough, neither China nor the United States has the power simply to command a block and to recreate the Cold War. China is incredibly reliant on its markets and investments in the rest of the world, its access to resources and minerals. It is certainly accelerating its technological autonomy from the United States, but it's not a China that's going to cut itself off from the rest of the world, and nor is the United States. So what, what each country is doing is rebalancing their relationship with the rest of the world. 
And, and I think that's an important one to understand. I, I personally think that there's a huge opportunity for other countries in the system, and we're already seeing that happen. When other countries, including European countries, realize that their best chance is to collectivize. So suddenly we see the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement starting to pick up steam. We see Latin American countries starting to come together, finalize their trade treaty with the European Union. We see other countries in Asia starting to be more careful about which, which, uh, which way they go and with whom on each of the choices they make. So I think that there are opportunities here for countries to start more um, finding other kinds of cooperation that will work well for them and selectively cooperating with one side or the other. Let me ask Aaron, a follow-up I question. Could, uh, please jump please in, do, Neil. Briefly jump in. Uh, it's kind of symbolic, isn't it, that Ian has vanished. Uh, I think this is to try to illustrate the lack of American leadership, uh, even in this debate. But we don't need American leadership because we've got Professor Yan, whose work I greatly admire and have learned a lot from. I'm going to very respectfully disagree with him on just two points quickly. F first, I don't think it's right to say that Cold War II is just about technology, whereas Cold War I was about ideology, because Cold War I was about technology too. After all, the Soviet Union specialized uh, in intellectual property theft, starting with the atomic bomb. Uh, and I think if you look at Cold War II, which I regard as having begun last year, if not the year before, it has its ideological component too. Xi Jinping is the most explicitly Marxist-Leninist uh, leader that China has had since Mao. Uh, and when one looks at uh, Chinese policy, whether it's towards Hong Kong uh, or the uh, Uyghur minority in Xinjiang, uh, I'm struck very forcibly by the resemblances to the old Soviet Union. Totalitarianism is totalitarianism at its core, even if it wraps what looks like a private sector economy around it. The second point I'd make, which is important here, is that the Cold War in its first iteration wasn't a purely bipolar phenomenon, and it's a caricature to represent it as two sides and you had to choose. There was this thing called the non-aligned movement, which actually started in the 1950s, and Parag, as you know, it included India. India was extremely important. Egypt, uh, uh, Iraq joined, uh, and, uh, and Yugoslavia, uh, to name just a few of the countries that became a part of the non-aligned movement. So we shouldn't expect Cold War II uh, not to have a non-aligned movement. It already clearly has one. Uh, and, and I think the big question to which I don't have an answer is just how big will the non-aligned movement be? I think that's going to depend a lot on how persuasive American and Chinese arguments are. But I just want to revert to the key theme of our, our presentations today. When you look at the leadership that each side has attempted, the United States and China, during 2020, it seems to me that the US has had more wins than China. Operation Warp Speed for vaccines, the Fed's swap and repo facilities, the anti-Huawei policy, which now has the UK as well as Germany pretty much on board. There's been plenty of followership to just emphasize the importance of followership uh, where, when you look at what the United States has actually achieved this year. Even if people continue to heap uh, opprobrium on President Trump, they, they do tend to accept American leadership more readily than they accept Chinese leadership. And you could see that when the Chinese foreign minister had a rather frosty reception uh, in Europe just a, a week or so ago. Very good points. Thank you so much. One of the outstanding questions, which uh, we're running out of time in this portion of the debate, is that's worth thinking about, is in what functional or thematic areas can we imagine the West accepting or even deferring to Chinese uh, or non-Western leadership? And perhaps that's something that you would like to address in your closing statements. We're going to turn to those right now. Each of our speakers will have two minutes, and we will proceed in the same order that we did in the opening statements. So, uh, Ian Bremer, I know you can hear us. Uh, you have two minutes on the clock for your closing statement. Please begin. I hope you hello. can hear us. Uh, I'm, there you I'm, are. Hello. Great. Can you hear me? Oh, that's good. Um, it, it, it clearly, absent American leadership, uh, there is an impact on the quality of global debate. Um, and I blame Neil for, for sabotaging uh, <laughs> my connection. Um, look, look I, I think the question in front of us is to what extent this, what, what we're experiencing in the pandemic is a new normal, and no one has yet defined that. Let me, let me tell you what we're looking at. 
it's a major crisis, the worst of our lifetimes. But we've had a few major crises in the last 20, 30 years, and the responses have been very different. After 9-11, there was a rally around the flag effect in the United States, 92% approval for President Bush. The Europeans also supporting the U.S., a massive coalition to go after al-Qaeda, to fight the Taliban, um, and even the Russians, erstwhile enemy and antagonist of the United States at that point, let the Americans use bases in Central Asia to help with logistics. 2008 financial crisis, Bush and Obama working together to ensure that we get out of crisis. We put together a G20, heads of state meetings, the best, the most functional summit ever had in that format was April 2009 in London, where the countries came together. And even the Chinese working constructively to try to help ensure that we don't have a global depression, that we get out of this global recession. Now we have the pandemic and a global shutdown, a global bug, a global virus. And it's not bringing the world together. It's bringing us further apart. And the reason are the structural conditions, the fact that the institutions are less aligned with the balance of power and the values and the governance of the countries that reflect that, the fact that the United States is still, as Neil says, very much powerful, but not interested in cooperating, whether it's leaving the World Health Organization or vaccine nationalism and investing in their own. Neil's right. Warp speed's going really well. It's not going really well for other countries that aren't participating in it. The Americans are working on this themselves. The U.S.-China relationship is getting worse in this environment. It's true. Nairi said the Germans, the Europeans are doing a lot in terms of governance for Europe. That's not global governance. It's helping Europe stay together. It's real redistribution of cash. But it's very different than global leadership. Heck, Russia's showing leadership in Belarus right now. Nobody else is going to. There might be a couple of sanctions. The end of the day, Lukashenko is not going anywhere because the Russians are important, are dominant across their borders. But that's not global leadership. So let me just go back to what we're debating here. The question in front of all of us is, is the world going to have, going to have leadership and it's going to be um, it's going to let a leaderless and more divided globe? And we're going to have less global leadership and we're going to be more divided. And there's nothing I've heard from the other side that makes us believe that that's not indeed going to be the case. Thank you so much, Ian. Uh, let's turn it over to Neil. You have two minutes for the closing statement. Thanks, Parag. Well, if, if anyone kicked uh, Ian off Zoom, it, it wasn't me. Uh, it's much more likely to have been China, given uh, uh, what's been said about Zoom this year. Look, uh, let's be very clear in concluding this debate. Uh, the world isn't leaderless, uh, 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 and, and the world is divided, but that's normal. A new normal is sort of a contradiction in terms. Uh, so clearly, uh, this, this is a, a motion to be thrown out, uh, and I feel sure that when uh, listeners come to vote again, they'll, they'll vote the right way this time. I think Ian Bremmer suffers from American primacy nostalgia. Did you notice that he, he looked back fondly on the happy days after 9-11 and happy days of the financial crisis when the world came together under American leadership? I must say the rest of the world doesn't quite remember it like that, Ian. Um, I don't know about you, but on the anniversary, the 19th anniversary of 9-11, I wasn't nostalgically looking back to the glory days of neoconservatism and American leadership as it uh, emerged after the terrorist attacks. And as for the financial crisis, uh, it seems to me that uh, that's not exactly a paradigm that we should want to to replicate. Uh, it seems to me actually that uh, our response to the pandemic has been superior uh, to our response uh, to the financial crisis, uh, even although the crisis itself is much, much larger, uh, poses a much greater threat, not just to bank solvency, but to human health. A fascinating feature of 2020 has been the way the pandemic exposed uh, the weakness of international or multilateral institutions. The World Health Organization actually played a disgraceful role 
it had complied or uh, even connived with China to hush up the seriousness of the crisis of COVID-19 uh, in January. It was very late to recognize that there was a global pandemic. I spotted it before the WHO, for God's sake, and I'm just a historian. Uh, in many ways, the way the WHO performed in 2020 illustrated the validity of much of Donald Trump's critique of international institutions. Uh, and ultimately, as I've said, when the US uh, led uh, itself without going through institutions like the WHO, the results were extraordinarily impressive, whether you look at the financial response, the vaccine response, or the ongoing technology war that uh, I think it's quite right uh, that Professor Yan emphasizes. I think what's fascinating about 2020 is that it's revealed the cynicism of Chinese leadership, and it's affirmed that the US is still the number one leader in a world that will always need more than one leader. Thank you so much, Neil. Professor Yan, your closing remarks. You have two minutes. Okay. Uh, well, actually, I will, uh, I sharing uh, Yan's argument, but uh, I will make the same arguments from a different perspective. And uh, any kind of a global leadership and uh, requires two things, uh, two necessary conditions. And the first is the resources, and means the capability, material capability, to, for providing a, a global leadership for the world. Second, is the political willingness. They're willing to use the resources to provide the leadership for the world. Actually, at this moment, we find that both United States and China has no willingness to provide global leadership for the world. And the Trump has clearly stated, he think it's a waste of American resources for providing leadership for the world. Then the, he said, uh, they, they, this is not clever enough. And uh, for China, China said that, uh, okay, we, special, we emphasize our Chinese, uh, uh, Chinese socialism with the Chinese, uh, socialism with the Chinese characteristic. That means, uh, okay, our road, our model is not suitable for anyone else. So we cannot and, uh, provide the leadership to you because this model is based on Chinese communist leadership. Without the Chinese communist leadership, this model are not suitable for anyone. So second is the resources. And the resource, resources is that US and China become the, in the bipolar world, that means that neither one can make a, a force the other side to follow its leadership, right? China can now lead U.S., U.S. can now lead China. So that's why there's no, uh, uh, no resources to uh, create the uh, global leadership. The last point is that why it is not Cold War? This won't be Cold War II. It will be digital, digital war one. And this is a digital war uh, for the world. Digital technology will become the major resources of national uh, wealth. The majority of national uh, wealth of the major powers were generated by digital technology rather than the natural resources or the something else. Second, digital cyber security will be the core of national security, which heavily rely on the digital technology rather than anything else. So all of the major powers will heavily and hold the hand about the cybersecurity. So this time, the digital technology have a totally different influence on international politics than nuclear technology during the Cold War, the finally. And the China has clearly and said that, do not want to have an ideological confrontation with the United States. And since uh, July 7th of this year, Chinese government frequently repeated, and we don't want to have an ideological a confrontation with the United States, no matter what the reason. But at least for China's own sake, for our own interests, we know and the ideological confrontation is not in favor of China. So that's why I think ideology cannot become the major factor dri uh, uh, driving the competition between China and the United States. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, Nairi, uh, two minutes, please. Yeah, so, so there's lots in this debate, and one part of it is a wrestling match about whether it's China or the United States that's, that's leading the world. And I want to close by just pointing out that collaborative leadership is what we're seeing quite powerfully emerge. That there was a fashion a decade ago in the private sector 
to applaud the kind of charismatic macho leaders until people started looking at their corporate results and said, actually, they're not building resilient companies. And they started looking more at collaborative leaders who could actually mobilize effectively, you know, to, to, to achieve great results um, in, a, in a resilient way. And I think that's what we're seeing at the international level and at the national level. A lot of today's debate has been about global power, but actually the leadership that really matters to most people in the world is their leadership much closer to home. And there, undisputably, we're seeing in every country of the world a yearning for strong leadership. And in some countries, in, in some of the wealthiest countries of the world, that's because a large group of people economically feel that they've been left behind. Culturally, they feel they've been left behind. And they're yearning for a new transformative leadership that can help restore them to their rightful place. In so many parts of the world that the, the students I teach come from, there's a sense that, that leaders in government and business have simply for the last 30 years been handmaidens of globalization and haven't paid attention to security, to assuredness at home. So I think what we're seeing, the great news is that COVID-19 across those exact same countries has unleashed a lot of business leaders to say, you know what, we need to build back better. We need now to forge a new kind of deal. We need to rethink the way we work with governments, the way we work in our communities to ensure that we build back better. And that's gonna be a collaborative kind of leadership between business, between government, at local levels with communities. And similarly, to, to draw the threads together from today's debate, it's gonna be a different kind of global leadership where neither the United States nor China can simply swagger onto the stage and, and declare rules for all others in the system. It's going to be a system where lots of negotiation is required and where every forum that we have in the world where people can speak and negotiate is going to be necessary. And that to me is leadership and it's leadership of a collaborative kind. And I think the world is seeing a lot of leadership emerging. Thank you so much, Nairi, and thanks to all of our debaters this evening. There have been very compelling statements made and arguments. This has been a very rich discussion. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is time for our closing poll. Let us see which side has done uh, the best job of uh, convincing or swaying our uh, audience all over the world. Thank you so much to everyone for staying online. We'll now take, uh, you'll now see the closing poll, so please do go ahead and cast your votes. You'll have um, a couple of minutes uh, to do this, um, so please cast your votes uh, one way or the other. Will a leaderless and divided world be the new normal? Let me turn to KP. What did you think? Um, were you swayed? Was it, uh, you know, fragmentation and division? Or is it more a new, new kinds of leadership that are emerging and countries choosing in a marketplace of different leaders? Uh, pa Parag, I'm, I'm not even going to even dare to give my two bits uh, in, in terms of the substance of the debate itself. I only have two points to make. I think the, the first one is, I think, regardless of what the polling is going to be, the real winners of this debate really is the audience. I think the quality of the debate, the robustness of the arguments that have been put forth, I think that's really so enlightening to the audience. And the poll and the sway and the opinions and so on will simply reflect how the robustness of the debate has enriched the thinking of the audience itself. So I think that's the first thing we have to recognize, that the polls are not going to indicate winners between the debaters. It's going to indicate how, it, how the debate itself has led to thinking among the audience itself. The, the second point is that I clearly, for, for, for me personally, as, as chairman of the Singapore Summit, I clearly would want to have more debates in future Singapore summits. We had discussed, debated amongst ourselves a little while whether we wanted to have a debate or not. We were worried about how bland it might be. But to see four friends who are congenial, polite, but passionate in their adversarial advocacy of their points of view, I think has hugely benefited the audience. And I really would like to see more debates in the future. And I really want to give my thanks to, to the debaters themselves for the robustness of their arguments. Well, I will second that motion, KP. Thank you so much for uh, weighing in. Um, now, it turns out our poll results are in. Uh, for those who can or cannot see them live, let me share. During the opening poll, 61% agreed with the motion, 
and 39% disagreed. Now, after hearing the statements in the debate, the number, the percentage that agree has fallen to 46%, whereas the percentage that disagrees has risen to 54%. So it's a 15% swing in favor of the opposition to the motion. So we will uh, officially declare them the winner. But again, let me uh, reinforce what KP said. I think everyone wins this evening from what was a really stimulating and comprehensive discussion. So it's uh, left just for me to thank you all for this, uh, for your rich contributions, for being part of this conversation, uh, wherever you have been around the world, but most especially our four panelists. Thank you so much. And now let me hand it back over to KP.